Welcome once again, my fellow manipulators of digital fate. I'm Richie, this is Capricorn. We have another video here going over a new batch of leaks from Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Now, it looks like that pre-release pack that ended up leaking. We had uh, two packs already get, get opened up from that, and we checked those out in the last video. Looks like we have the third pack from that pre-release kit to look at here. Now, in the last video, I didn't zoom in on each card individually because I thought the image quality wasn't good enough and it was going to be too blurry, but in hindsight, I think it's probably better that we zoom in on each card and do our best to kind of present each card just so that you have the opportunity to at least try to follow along and read the card for yourself uh, instead of staring at the same the same image the whole time and uh, just uh, listening to me go on and on and on. So. We're going to do our best to do that today, but the leaks are pretty gnarly, and uh, I'm excited to get to it. So first off, we have Black Nag Buzzard. I'm pretty sure it's Black black Snag Buzzard. One black and two for a 2-1 bird with flying, and when it enters the battlefield, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it if a creature something this turn probably died, I would assume. It's also got plot for what looks like one black and one. And that's terrifying. If you saw our last um, leak spoiler video, uh, the first plot card and the mechanics around how it actually work were spoiled in that video. So the way plot works is you pay the plot cost and you're able to exile it into exile from your hand. Uh, kind of like foretell, except instead of just two colorless mana to foretell someone uh, to foretell something, it's gonna be a specific cost that's different card to card to card to actually put it into exile. Whereas then playing it from exile is always the same cost, which is kind of the opposite of foretell. With foretell, you had to uh, pay, play it from exile for a specific cost, and it was always two to go into exile. So this time it's a different cost depending on the card to go into exile, but it's always going to be the same cost to play it from exile, and that cost is free which is kind of what makes it sort of busted, in my opinion. Uh, it seems crazy to me that you could just start to plot things off to the side and have a bunch of stuff stockpiled in Exile and wait until you have some sort of payoff for ETBs or for playing a bunch of spells in the same turn and then just fire them all off in the same turn. Maybe you've got prowess creatures down and a bunch of sorceries plotted and you just play them all for zero. Or maybe you're playing an older format and you're playing Storm and you can just storm off with a bunch of free spells. Or, you know, maybe you have War Leaders call in play and now you can just slam seven creatures onto the battlefield for zero cost each because they've been plotted and you can just get seven ping triggers. Uh, it seems like it might be busted if you build around it and I'm a little worried about it. Honestly, I think this is... This has the potential to be more busted than Discover, uh, potentially on the same level as Adventures uh, were in the original Throne of Eldraine set, which is kind of scary. And my one thing that I said in the last video was, I hope that the plot costs aren't too small. I hope that on average they're costing the same or maybe a little more to plot them than to just hard cast them normal. Um, and that if we have too many plot costs that are two or less, it could become problematic. And this card proves that, at least as far as what it looks like, plot costs of two are a thing on just commons. And that's worrisome, honestly. I'm kind of scared. Plot's looking a little busted. It's kind of crazy. But we're going to move on to the next card. Slick Shot Vault Buster. This is one blue and two for a creature human rogue. It is a 1-4 with Vigilance. And... It gets plus two, plus O oh, as long as you've committed a crime this turn. So, for those of you who don't know yet, the mechanic of committing a crime exists within this set, and basically you commit you commit a crime that turn if at any point during the turn you've targeted something of your opponent's or targeted your opponent themselves. So, if you do that during a turn, you will have committed a crime for that turn until the end of turn, and then any of these committed a crime triggers have the potential to, um, you know, go off for you. So a 1-4 Vigilance, that can become a 3-4 for 
for three mana if you're targeting your opponent. Pretty decent at the common slot. Moving on, we've got Bridled Bighorn. This is one white and three for a creature sheep mount. It is a 3-4 Vigilance, and whenever it attacks, while it's saddled, you create a 1-1 one, one white sheep creature token, and then it saddles for two. So, this, this new mount creature type, we went over this in the last video as well, it's pretty interesting. It's basically like a vehicle, except also a creature. So instead of having the downside that vehicles normally have of if you don't have creatures to crew them with, um, they kind of do nothing and sit there for the most part, Mounts sort of walk a fine line between creature and vehicle, where they are a creature uh, on their own, but then if you're able to crew them, in this case it's called saddling, saddle for two here, uh, works the same as crew. You know, tap creatures with t power totaling two to saddle this creature, and when it's saddled, it just becomes a better version of itself. Um, it becomes able to give you extra value from being saddled, so... It's, it's a little bit easier to sort of build around than vehicles are because you're not required to saddle the creature in order for it to actually still be able to impact the board and be a creature. But it is going to get that buff of, you know, if you can tap two powers worth of creature here when you swing with it, swing as a 3-4 Vigilance no matter what, but then it's also going to give you a 1-1. One, one. So pretty cool at the common slot. I'm seeing a lot of commons that are actually uh, a lot more playable than in past sets. And I think I mentioned that in the last spoiler video as well. Moving on, we've got Prickly Pear. This is one red and two for a 2-2. Two -two. And when it enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 one -one red mercenary creature token that can tap to give a creature plus one plus oh until end of turn. But you can only use that tap ability at sorcery speed. So, pretty interesting. Uh, it looks like that mercenary thing is a mechanic within this set, that there are going to be a lot of cards that create these 1-1 one, one mercenaries that can buff up something's power at sorcery speed. But it's interesting that it's sorcery speed because that means you can't utilize it as a combat trick, which would probably make it a little busted. You have to commit to whatever creatures you are buffing up before you move to combat. And you also can't do it when you're on the defense. So... That kind of makes me think that if there are enough of these mercenary cards, the set is definitely a little bit tilted more towards being aggressive um, and your creatures being better on the attack than they're going to be on defense because these mercenaries are all over the place that are able to buff up, but really only only before attacks, right? So uh, pretty cool card here. I like that it's a plant. <laughs> plant tribal, let's go. Is Insidious Roots going to get more support? I guess we'll see. Next up, we've got a reprint of Snakeskin Veil. One green, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. It gains Hexproof until end of turn. We've seen this card before. Pretty cool that it's coming back, though. Uh, this was one of the best one mana instant speed gives something Hexproof spells that we, we saw back when it first came out in Standard. Uh, I forget exactly which set that was. If you remember, let me know in a comment down below. Um... But it was, it was probably the best spell when it first came out at doing that because it leaves behind this plus one, plus one counter. It leaves this board presence on the board for the rest of the game. That's not just an until end of turn thing, which is pretty cool. Next up, we've got Harrier Strix. One blue for a 1-1 one, one flying bird. When it enters the battlefield, you tap target permanent. You can also pay one blue and two, I believe, to draw a card and then discard a card. So, the loot ability is a little overcosted here, but when you take into account the fact that it's just a common and it's already a 1-1 one, one flyer for one with an extra ETB ability that can tap down a permanent, it's pretty good, honestly. At the common level, this is a pretty good little evasive flyer uh, with some extra utility stacked on, and then a mana sink for later in the game. So I absolutely think this guy is worth running in your limited deck, uh, maybe as the 23rd card, but that mana sink being a mana sink on a creature that's pretty decently on rate for what it is to begin with is pretty cool. Next up, we've got Boneyard Desecrator. This is, I believe, one black and three, it looks like, for a three-something menace zombie mercenary we don't know what the toughness is here um 
But it also has pay one black and one, sacrifice another creature, put a plus one plus one counter on Boneyard Desecrator. If an outlaw was sacrificed this way, create a treasure token, which seems really cool. Now, this is a card that details the fact that there is a new batch of creatures within this set. What I mean by batching is that five different creature types are sort of combined together to be uh, what is known as outlaws, and there are going to be a bunch of cards within this set that interact specifically with outlaws. So outlaws uh, include any creatures of the type assassin, mercenary, rogue, uh, warlock, and I believe the last one is pirate. If I'm wrong about that and you guys can read it, correct me in the comments below. Um, but a 3-something menace for 4 mana with this ability seems kind of okay for common. I like the fact that it not only gives you a counter, but also ramps you uh, for 2 mana. Like, 2 mana to make a treasure token and make your guy bigger seems pretty decent. Now, you're going to want to, you know, you're going to want to have stuff that you actually want to sacrifice to this. So, uh, the mercenary tokens that you're creating uh, with certain certain cards in this set are probably going to be the best use of this ability because there are probably cards within the set that can pump those out pretty easily um, and you can probably sacrifice them without losing too too much so that might be some sort of a an archetype that limited builds towards but pretty interesting card next up we've got something dog dog something Something dog. We don't know exactly what this is. We can only see part of the card. But it's two mana for a creature something squirrel. And something to do with your end step. If you did something with this from your hand, you put a counter on... Ooh, prairie dog. It's called prairie dog. At the end of your turn, if you would something or something... Something to do with plus one plus one counters on something. Put that many plus one on it instead. Hmm. Interesting. So at the end of end of your turn, you probably put counters on it. If certain conditions are met. Uh, and then you get to increase the number of counters that go on it as well. Seems like it has the potential to be really powerful. If it's like a Luminarch Aspirant style card, uh, that's you know two mana and but the counters can only go on itself. But then there's conditions to get even more counters at end of turn, depending on depending on what happened during the turn. It might even have to do with plotting. If a card is plotted, you get a counter. Not sure. If you have an idea of what you think this ability might be, let me know in the comments below. Uh, this could go a lot of different ways, but this is an uncommon, so with with those two abilities, even though we don't know exactly what they're doing, it does seem like this guy's going to be pretty good as a 2-2 two, two for 2 with some pretty crazy plus 1 plus 1 counter upside. But we're going to move on here. This is Marauding Sphinx, 2 blue and 3 for a 3-5 three, Sphinx Rogue with Flying, Vigilance, and Ward 2. Whenever you commit a crime, you Surveil 2, this ability triggers only once each turn. Uh, this is another uncommon. Again, this is a pretty good card, I think, for limited specifically. 3-5 uh, Flying Vigilance is a pretty good win condition at 5 mana. If it was more than 5, I'd be a little bit worried about it. But at 5 mana, it seems like a pretty decent win condition. And then that Ward 2 gives it some nice survivability. And then being able to Surveil 2 every time you target your opponent or one of their things... Um, only once a turn given but still that's some extra gravy that's that's actually got some decent worth being able to make sure you set up your next draw by looking at the top two and maybe even set up your graveyard with some value is a nice little you know extra value stacked on top of what is already a pretty decent limited creature so i expect this to see some play in limited it's also worth noting it's a rogue so if rogue is one of those rogue is one of those outlaw outlaw types for sure right so yeah so this this counts as an outlaw too which is kind of nice not necessarily one you want to sacrifice but i'm sure there are other outlaw payoffs as well moving on we have shifting grift two blue mana for a sorcery but it has this new ability called spree 
Spree means you have to choose one or more of the options listed and pay the additional mana cost for the option for the options that you pick. So it's kind of like multi kicker, uh, except you have to choose one. You can't just pay, uh, pay the two blue and nothing else to play this um, because there's no ability. But more so than that, the spree ability itself specifically says you have to choose one or more additional costs. So at plus two mana, you exchange control of two target creatures, plus one mana, exchange control of two target artifacts, and plus one mana, exchange control of two target enchantments. Now, obviously this card's going to be super fun in multiplayer, <laughs> uh, commander and stuff like that, because you can just really mess with people's board states, make your opponent swap things with each other that are just going to mess up their strategies, and it seems really fun and political. Uh, but even just one-on-one, -on -one, you can do some pretty crazy stuff with this. If you have a token-based deck, um, maybe you have roll tokens, and you can trade them a roll token for a relevant enchantment. That would be sick. Maybe you have, like, blood tokens or map tokens, and you can steal one of their really good artifacts. Um, obviously, you can give them a really crappy token creature and take their best creature as well. So, absolutely crazy amount of value here if you have the right conditions to be able to get multiple of these modes to pop off. Uh, could be a really powerful card, but just the fact that we're seeing this ability spree here for the first time is pretty interesting of an, in and of itself, and it does mean that they're trying to dig deeper into that design space within this set and probably even within the sets after this set, um, where they're really trying to give you plenty of options for a bunch of different cards. Um, so I'm expecting to see a lot of cards within the set that are going to have this spree ability. Next up, we've got Gearhead. Gearhead returns as Mirror of the Wilds. Three mana in Naya colors. One white, one green, one red for a 3-3 three, three haste. And he makes it so non-token creatures you control have tap, create a token that's a copy of target token you control that entered the battlefield this turn. Um, so this guy's pretty nuts. The fact that he's just a 3-3 three, three haste for a 3 is pretty decent in and of itself. And also note that he doesn't say other non-token creatures you control have this ability. So he has the ability himself to come in and then immediately with haste, tap himself to make a copy of any token you have on the battlefield. Um, it ha sorry, any token that entered the battlefield this turn specifically. Um, but if you're using it with the right cards, I feel like this could be pretty darn busted. Um, we've already got three blind mice that can make you know, token copies of other tokens every turn. Uh, we have things like Obnixilis that make really powerful tokens. I'm sure there's going to be other ways in this set of making really powerful tokens. The key is we need to be able to copy something that was made this turn. I also feel like this card uh, pairs really well with Ginny Fey. Uh, because Ginny Fey, every time you get a token, it's going to turn into a bigger token, right? And then you can tap the Ginny Fey itself and or the Gear Ed to make copies of those bigger tokens, which is pretty interesting. So I like this guy a lot. My dog is snoring. Bandit, stop snoring. Thank you. I'm trying to record. I appreciate it. Gear Ed, sick card. Moving on, we have a reprint of Siphon Insight, which is interesting because this is still in Standard right now, although if Standard rotated the way it was supposed to, it wouldn't be, so it kind of makes sense that it would be here. This is one black, one blue for an instant. Uh, you get to exile the top two cards of target opponent's library. Uh, sorry, look at the top two, pick one of them to exile, and then you can play it from exile at any point in time, and then it flashes back for three mana. We've seen this before, but pretty cool art here, even though it's super blurry uh, and we can't really make out all the detail as well as we'd like. Um, so, very cool. Moving on, we've got Stop Cold, one blue and three for an enchantment aura. It has Flash, Enchant Artifact or Creature. When Stop Cold enters the battlefield, you tap Enchanted Permanent. An enchanted permanent loses all abilities and doesn't untap during its controller's unstep. During its controller's untap step. Sorry. My dogs are being annoying. I'm trying to record and it's kind of hilarious. Shout out to the doggos in the comments below. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
this is just common removal. It's pretty decent, right? But it, it uh, it's probably your 23rd card. And then the last card of the day, we have another example of deserts returning. If you didn't catch my, my first video for leaks, deserts are returning to uh, standard. And we have what looks like one of each color pair, both allied and enemy color pairs, that comes into play tapped. And then when it enters the battlefield, it pings for one damage. Uh, seems really cool. Any, any kind of spells that can put a whole bunch of lands into play at the same time uh, are going to be really good with this. In particular, there's a deck in standard right now with some of the new cards that can put a lot of things from the graveyard, a lot of lands from the graveyard directly into play. So a self-mill deck that does that could potentially use a bunch of deserts to just end the game outright. Uh, but more importantly than that, I'm interested in seeing if there are even more deserts at the the higher rarities that are, you know, are going to do interesting things in and of themselves. But I'm wondering if they're also going to open up the ability to sack your deserts to do stuff. Because if these can ping when they enter the battlefield, and then you have a way later on to use even better deserts that are like rares to sack these common deserts to get even more value out of them, uh, that would be pretty rad. So this one, this one itself is called Eroded Canyon. This is the Is It Desert, and uh, yeah, pretty cool. So anyway, that's all the leaks we got today. Is there any any mechanic or card in particular that you're excited about or worried about being broken? Because I'm no, I know I'm worried about plot, but uh, <laughs> let me know in the comments. Uh, more are on the way. I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna still try and put out some spoiler shorts for some of the cards that have the better quality. Uh, try to get those up for you guys to check out in the spoiler shorts feed. Um, but with all of that, that brings us to the conclusion of the video. Thanks for checking it out. More spoilers are on the way. Check out my deck text if you're interested in that, and I'll catch you guys next time. Thanks so much for checking out my channel. I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons over at Patreon. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. So honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your contributions. If you haven't yet, like and subscribe. The more likes we get and the quicker we get them, the bigger this channel will grow and the faster it will grow. I'd love nothing more than this channel to become something very special for you guys, but it's entirely up to you how fast that happens. Also, if you'd like more deck text, that's somewhere over there and if you'd like to see what else the channel's been up to lately that's somewhere up that way also subscribe circle below do all the things